search of our cosmic origins. Located high in the Andes mountain range, the 66 antennas that make up the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA, are an imposing sight. Under one sky, more than 20 countries embark upon a scientific endeavor that can only be realized through collaboration. North America, Europe, East Asia, and Chile work together to answer humankind's fundamental questions. Northern Chile was chosen as the site for ALMA because the Atacama Desert is the driest in the world. Its atmosphere, almost devoid of water vapor, enables detection of some of the faintest signals from the universe. Over 16,500 feet above sea level and covering distances of up to 10 miles of the Chachnantor Plateau, the ALMA antennas work as a single large telescope. A supercomputer combines and synchronizes all of their signals in real time. Thanks to this engineering and scientific feat, we're learning about the cold universe, the secrets of planet formation, and the chemical elements that constitute the building blocks of life. Professionals from around the world work for ALMA, pushing the limits of knowledge every day. In Chile, about 50 staff members are based in Santiago, while another 200 work in shifts at the operations support facility close to the town of San Pedro de Atacama. Most of the staff works in the offices, laboratories, and antenna control room of this facility at an altitude of 9,500 feet. Others ascend to the Chachnantor Plateau at 16,500 feet to maintain and relocate the antennas, among other tasks. Strict safety protocols are crucial under these conditions. Thanks to leisure and residential facilities, staff can lead a healthy lifestyle, playing sports and games, watching movies, enjoying nutritious meals, and resting in comfort. plays a key role in global astronomical efforts. Along with other radio telescopes, it allowed the first image of a black hole to be captured. Without ALMA, that goal would have been unattainable. The Chilean astronomical community actively participates in ALMA research and discoveries using its 10% of observing time. The radio telescope also contributes to workforce development and supports national and regional scientific, technological, and outreach projects. An example of the latter are the thousands of visitors who tour the facilities each year. ALMA respects the local Likanantai or Atacameño indigenous culture, supporting educational and other projects in the town of Toconao and San Pedro de Atacama, preserving archaeological heritage sites, and protecting the unique flora and fauna of the region, to name a few initiatives. Mirroring the antennas that work in unison with one goal, under the same sky, the international collaboration that ALMA embodies continues the search of our cosmic origins. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this live tour that we're doing of the ALMA Observatory. My name is Thais Mandiola. I'm a visitor coordinator here at ALMA. Thank you for joining us today. We will have great guests. They'll be sharing with us their knowledge and make us travel to ALMA with this understanding of each pieces that conforms the observatory. Today, 
we will learn especially about the transporters, Otto and Lore. Um, but be, before we start, I wanted to make um, an important point that is to clarify that at this moment, there are no visits allowed to the observatory because of the pandemic. Um, in fact, the ALMA observatory is not working 100% yet. Okay, but our interviewers will tell us a little bit more about this and how they've been working all these months. Um, today, around 260 people work in ALMA, but few of the people know exactly that 80% of the staff are Chilean. Yeah, and 65% of our staff work at the high site or in the base camp, in the facilities that are located in the northern um, part of Chile, near San Pedro de Atacama. But well, as we're seeing now in this beautiful image of the transporter, we're going now more onto the subject that we're touching today, okay? These are these huge machines called the transporters. Alma actually uses these two giant trucks, they're called Otto and Lore, to move the antennas because they are not installed forever in the same place or in the same path, okay? Uh, they must be re relocated accordingly to the needs of the observations of the astronomers. So this is being done throughout the year. At 5,000 meters of altitude, in Chagnantor Plateau, the antennas have 16 kilometers of area to work all together as if they were a giant eye with a very sharp view focused on a small portion of the sky. Um, it's like putting a telelens on your camera on other times when you need to observe a larger portion of the sky. Um, you need this zoom in of the this information of the um, universe, no? So in that case, if you have to achieve a very specific and um, um, uh, detailed area, you could say, you have to distance the antennas. And that's where these big trucks come in and make these relocations, okay, to capture the different um, zoom in or zoom out of the universe. When the astronomers, need to study like a um, nebula or a um, uh, galaxy in this case, they will require, require, as we said, to distance the antennas. And the maximum distance that you have that are really 16 kilometers off um, from one antenna to the other. The antennas, they also require maintenance or some repairment. So in which case, Otto and Lore have to take them down from the Chagnantor Plateau to the base camp. And it's a very slowly pace that they need to do this because the very um, heavy, heavy machines, the antennas and the transporter. These yellow titans are able to place the antennas with millimetric precision on the paths and keep them always powered during the transport that they do up to the high side or down to the base camp. Otto and Lore, they were made, they were custom made for Alma. There are not others like them in the world, actually. They have very special braking systems and safety devices that prevents any accidents and to protect really the antenna that is a um, very delicate machine too. So, so just to take it care of the, um, the antenna, they have very specialized protective systems that shut down the machine if they see any danger to the antenna, okay? Well, this the, the, um, our interviews can tell us a little bit more about that too, okay? So, well, today's guests, we, tell us more about this information and let me introduce you to both of them. Um, we have Mark Galilee, that he's a technical medical lead, uh, specialized on these machines, and Massimiliano Marchesi, he's a manager array from the maintenance group too. They've been working years on these incredible instruments. How are you guys? Welcome to the tour. Good, thank you. 
And we're seeing now some of the images here of the lifting of the antennas for the video. And well, touching more on the connection of how did you get to Alma, it would be great if you, each one of you can tell us a little bit of your uh, transit uh, career-wise, how did you got to work in Alma? So if we can start, any of you will be okay. Maybe Mark? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, Go ahead. So um, basically, I, I to start, I did a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, and after that, I was kind of wondering, you know, what, what can I do? And I, I really enjoy something that kind of uh, has some benefit for society um, and also, also is interesting. And uh, obviously space and and fundamental um, physics is kind of my really an interest for me. So um, firstly, I started off working on a, a space project. Um, this was based at CERN in Geneva. Um, and after that, I worked for CERN itself. And uh, I was kind of really enjoying the big uh, science type um, engineering, uh, working on fundamental um, engineering that, that really has benefit for humanity. And, mm -hmm. and actually, my, my family wanted to move back to the UK after that. So we, we moved back um, for a couple of years. And again, I was looking for something very interesting in, in kind of in kind of the, the space area of science. And I saw a post for Alma, uh, and I was really interested by it. Um, so I, I thought, you know, I'll go for it. And luckily, I got the interview. And finally, I, I was accepted for, for the job. And this is this brought me to Alma. Um, and I've been working here since 2018. And, you know, I absolutely really love the role. And, um, and that was your first time job. coming to Chile? Yeah, that was my first time coming to Chile. Um, but first time in South America as well. And I found it really amazing. Um, everyone was warm, welcoming. The team was amazing. So just thought, go for it. <laughs> and been really enjoying the job since. Perfect. Great. And did you work any time with this kind of instrument? Um, so the size of the transporter, something? What nothing that moves that size. Um, so we've fixed instruments of a similar size in the past, but nothing that has the same complexity and safety systems that, that you were mentioning. Um, you know, it's it's a huge machine that moves around. You, you've got to be really uh, aware of everything going on and make sure that the safe, correct safety protocols are in place for the people working on it as well. Um, no, it's really fantastic. Uh, and the fact that it, it picks up. Yes, it's spectacular. Yeah. But getting into it, you had like a training period, no? Yeah, uh, so really just uh, working with the operators, uh, understanding how the machine works, um, uh, working with also the team, um, with Mas Masuliano's team um, and the team in um, Europe that designed to understand really how the machine works. Um, uh, and still, you know, there are systems that I I, I don't understand on it. It's, uh, it's a very complex machine, uh, yeah. learning all the time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So um, in your case, Massimiliano, if you could tell us, because you've been working in Alma for Long time now, no? Yes, yes. Uh, well, I come from Italy, where I studied mechanical engineering, and uh, my career in uh, engineering started with uh, aerospace, pretty much like uh, uh, Mark. Uh, I've been involved in the university projects, some laboratories activities, uh, and also a few missions. So most uh, famous is uh, Rosetta mission, the one that landed mm -hmm. in the comet uh, uh, some uh, years ago, 2014. Yeah, that was an interesting period. Uh, and then, as Mark described, I also found uh, a, a news. At that time, uh, uh, it was in newspaper, really in the paper, <laughs> okay. And uh, so I apply, uh, I, I remember I cut it and I applied to this position. So in 2001, I moved to Chile 
almost 20 years. Uh, my first assignment as a, in a European Southern Observatory uh, has been in an optical telescope, uh, um, is a Paranal Observatory. So that is quite different to ALMA. Uh, everybody uh, know there is an enclosure on top of the telescope, so maintenance is also a bit uh, easier. Uh, okay, uh, there is no observation during daytime, so engineers have plenty of time uh, to, to do uh, things. Uh, while um, after some years uh, I moved to Germany, uh, where uh, these uh, two machines, uh, uh, Otto and Lore, were under design and final uh, uh, procurement, and also the 25 uh, European antenna. Uh, I participated to the last uh, design phase and uh, um, construction, and then uh, when the first uh, antennas came to Chile for final assembly, I moved back to Chile again. Um, and uh, yeah, as I started to say, the uh, challenging of a radio telescope in special place at 5,000 meter uh, is really. Uh, big. Uh, so the the antenna, as uh, people can see now in the video, are exposed to the environment. So uh, sometimes it's nice and sunny, but sometimes we have uh, bad weather. So that's make a lot of challenges in the maintenance group. So since a few years, uh, I'm uh, uh, in charge of a uh, team of uh, uh, maintenance for all the hardware, uh, scientific hardware uh, in uh, the observatory. So we take care of uh, antennas uh, and transporter, uh, as you can see in the video, uh, but also the instrumentation, correlator and many other uh, things. So yeah, it is a challenge. Every day there is a challenge in this uh, uh, yeah, of course. big but observatory. If we could stop a little bit more, that it was very interesting when you said that you were in Germany while they were designing the transporters and the antennas, some of them, no? Yes. So you saw really the birth of these machines where they were being born and then brought to Chile. So yeah, tell us correct. a little bit more about that because that, that's very interesting. Yeah, correct. Well, this, uh, as you said, uh, uh, ties at the beginning. This machine had been uh, uh, designed and manufactured on uh, a specific uh, task that is the one we are looking at the video now. So moving an antenna of 100 tons, so quite heavy uh, item, uh, from one place, uh, they run kilometers uh, to then deliver back the uh, the antenna to another foundation uh, at the, the same precision. So we are uh, below the millimeter uh, precision in the in in the position. And this part that is shown now is exactly the one that make the uh, the alignment with the ground. Okay. So at that time, uh, this company uh, that is producing many specialized uh, items like that, um, uh, vehicles like that, uh, got the challenge to produce them. Uh, they have a, a power engine and they have a, a, a big structure. Um, but uh, they also have to be very precise as uh, uh, for, for this positioning. Mm -hmm. So it's really a, a big uh, uh, effort. Um, ISO was uh, uh, preparing a, a detailed specification and then uh, following the contract. The machines arrived in uh, uh, Chile in 2007. Uh, they have almost blocked all the road from uh, uh, Calama to San Pedro for one day. Uh, because they are so big, uh, more than 12 meter uh, uh, width, uh, that that really uh, police has to stop everything to make them uh, uh, arriving to the observatory. Uh, and then finally, they were commissioned, and uh, the actual four operators that we have have been trained 
directly by the German uh, uh, company. And we have every shift, two of them working, no? Correct, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, the, the the group that take care about uh, uh, the transporter is composed of four um, drivers and that do also maintenance plus two engineers that take care of the high level uh, uh, planning and the procurement of spare parts. Uh, Mark is heavily involved since 2018 for some specialized maintenance uh, and also to keep the relation with the uh, ISO, the European Observatory, that is the owner of the machines, and uh, um, Shirley, that is the, the, the manufacturer. Yeah. It would be great if we give some numbers. So you already said that the antennas weigh 100 tons. How much the transporters weight? Yeah, Mark? I think you uh, they're 130 tons, Thais. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, probably. So we, Sorry? We the public to know about more of the measurements, the weights, how many wheels it has. If yeah. Uh, give those I mean, the, the width is it's a huge machine. So you can see it's um, 10, 10 meters wide, approximately by 20 meters long. So uh, I don't know what's that in terms of your average car, probably. Uh, five times wider and uh, five times longer as well, or, or maybe more. Um, so it, they're huge machines. Uh, they have uh, to be able to pick up the antennas, as Massimiliano said, they're 100 tons. So so it has um, 28 wheels, 14 different axles. Uh, they're all driven by a motor, each axle, um, hydraulically. Um, it, it's just an amazing machine that um, it, it works together um, in terms of the wheels turning independently, uh, you can t have them in different modes depending on if you if you want to move more sideways or, or if you're driving in normal driving. Uh, the operator can sit inside the cabin and drive backwards as well uh, with the the remote control that you may be seeing. Um, you can actually put the, turn the seats around and look out of the back window, so you can drive inside the cabin backwards or forwards with the steering wheel. Or actually outside with a remote control, as you've seen. Yeah, we've got an situations. There. Yeah, uh, and actually the remote control is very useful because um, in a relocation, um, you want to be able to see where the antenna is. Um, you're you're picking the antenna up with the machine, um, so you have to very precisely locate the machine next to the antenna, and the remote control really helps the, the vision of the operator to be able to uh, lift the machine to the antenna. How you can see here carefully, and then clamp it in place. So, in the case of the um, antenna relocation, would you tell us a little bit more of how is that process of the, the steps that are being done to make an antenna relocation and how long does it take? Yeah, yeah I think, uh, well, uh, the, these operators are uh, the person in charge permanently. Uh, uh, for the transporters, but then they need uh, another uh, group that is called the relocation team uh, that, that uh, is made up every day for this uh, specific task. So uh, the day uh, start with the program uh, some weeks before to prepare the destination uh, station, the one you see now, this concrete place with the three uh, supports, uh, prepare to receive the antenna and then um, the safety briefing that is important where all the safety checks are done in advance. Um, weather is also a very important uh, uh, factor, so we don't relocate uh, with the a high wind for the hazard that it can procure. Uh, so uh, the the day of the relocation, the team goes up to, goes up to the uh, chuck mentor. Uh, the operator take out uh, the uh, transporter, and uh, um, the operation usually is up to four hours, five hours, depending also on the length. The, the maximum distance is around 
10 kilometers. So uh, it drives very slow. And so this uh, enlarges, of course, the operation. Um, there are uh, three mechanical technicians that take care of the uh, fixing the antenna, which is the, uh, one of the delicate part. Then one electronic technician that take care of the movement of the antenna to position it properly to get on board of the uh, transporter. And um, yeah, the other uh, key factor is that uh, the transporter, uh, as you have seen in some of these videos, the transporter pick up uh, the antenna, uh, let's say vertically, but then it's uh, a slight, slight uh, in, in the inclined uh, surface. Uh, to position the antenna much in the center of the transporter. This is for, uh, let's say, center of mass uh, reason. Uh, otherwise, uh, it is unstable. Okay, so that's, uh, that's in a very short uh, description, uh, the relocation yeah. task. Yeah, and in the case of how long does it take to move it from with an antenna from the OSF, the base camp, to the high site, what speed is moving the transporter up and how long does it take for that movement? Uh, that's roughly four kilometers per hour. Well, four kilometers per hour on an incline is the, um, the maximum speed it can go. It's much, much slower than on a flat, which is 12 kilometers per hour with an antenna. Um, and I think it's roughly six hours, if you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, Massimiliano. Um, yeah, yeah, that's so, correct. Yeah, so roughly six hours to get. Kind of um, a, like a walking speed. No? So, yeah, like a <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. Uh, we have certain points where you can pull the, the transporter over and actually vehicles can pass because um, otherwise, um, you know, you can't, you can't continue with normal operations. We have uh, lighter vehicles that need to be uh, up to the, from the OSF uh, to the plateau at the AOS um, quite quickly. Um, if we have the transporter in the way, we have to plan carefully uh, around their movements. Um, and if they need to pass, we have to pull in these special pass points. Because Will we have so some wide. questions from the public, Mark? Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> let's see what are the questions. So Will Bear says, what kind of drive license need the operator for that machine? Is any drivers uh, yeah. that is um, needed? So it's, uh, I understand the, the team have a special heavy goods license anyway. Um, so it's a, a D license, I think, uh, here in Chile, if that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and also they have uh, special training from, uh, as Massimiliano said earlier, from the manufacturer. So um, I think I understand that was around six months. I, I wasn't here when the team were trained, but uh, I understand it's a real intense process uh, to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Let's see if we have other questions from our viewers today. Why do you relocate the antennas? Does it make a difference to move them a few meters in the scale of the observations? Yeah. Uh I would say there is a, 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 a lot of uh, algorithm that science uh, does to to make a, a precise uh, um, uh, decision on, on which moves. Uh, in the center where uh, the antenna are uh, um, more compact, few meters uh, uh, matters, let's say. Uh, but then with the, when we expand the array and we are in kilometer, of course, this is less important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it depends on the status uh, the, the astronomer are, are working uh, with. Yeah, and the weather, no? Because the weather changes throughout the year and you can have a big, um, the long baseline array during a part of the year and uh, the one that is close or the compact one, no? Yes, yeah, yeah. depending on the period. Usually we visit the, the biggest distance 
uh, every second year not every year we we expand otherwise this would be very too too fast and yes. too time consuming yes uh, let's see what other one we have here which astronomical objects does the alma targeting well this will be more of a for an astronomer to answer no <laughs> Yeah, correct. Fortunately, neither uh, Maybe Nico Mark, myself will help us with an answer if he wants to join. If not, we we'll can check more about specific of the transporter. They have other questions here. The um, of the fuel consumption, how we fuel the transporter if it's in the base camp, uh, how how much does it consume during the driving to the Chagnantor Plateau? If you can talk us through that information, please. That would be interesting. Mark? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Ice. Uh, so we have um, basically a, a possible fuel truck, um, which is uh, owned by Alma, um, our iron uh, infrastructure group colleagues. Uh, and they refuel the transporter. Um, roughly, it takes. Uh, it has two, actually, two engines, two separate engines, uh, two fuel tanks. Um, uh, together, they they take three thousand liters of fuel, um, and separately, um, it's one thousand five hundred each. And from uh, I understand from uh, the bottom uh, where the base camp is to the top in the plateau. Uh, it takes approximately 1,800 liters of fuel to do that trip, so it, it's a lot. It's not, it's not kind of your average truck or car. It's um, to do that trip is a big trip, and and we have to uh, spend a lot of fuel to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that takes six hours. So probably um, it, it varies in terms of the usage because uh, if you're on a flat road, it would be different to an incline. But I, I think. In that case, it's probably 3, 300 liters per hour, approximately, uh, of usage. Mm -hmm. And it's diesel, no? The, the, uh, sorry, yeah, it's diesel fuel. <laughs> yeah. And in the case of the wheels, how do they move? What kind of system is used for that? Uh, so they're on a hydraulic drive. Most of the systems actually are, are hydraulic on the transporter. So you have a, a pump with hydraulic oil, um, uh, and, and that um, sends it all through at pressure, and and each wheel has a hydraulic motor. Um, e each axle, sorry, independently has a hydraulic motor, which drives the axle. Um, and actually, the 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 brake system is also a sort of a hydraulic system. Um, and the, you have the steering system, um, and then the slide, the pickup system that you saw, the antenna. That's another hydraulic system. So um, there are actually a lot of a lot of different systems that we have to be aware of uh, and a lot of inspections that have to take place to make sure that those are safe for operation. I can imagine that all these systems, they need maintenance, repairments. So you have a program for that through the year that is like a calendar for specifics or if you can tell us a little bit more of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so maybe Massimiliano can mention the maintenance because yes. uh, he's Yes, uh, well, regular maintenance started uh, um, since the beginning. Uh, the machine, as I said, uh, were delivered between 2007 and 2008. So they are uh, above 10 years now. And uh, maybe, uh, so we envisage the standard uh, things like oil uh, check, uh, oil replacement, uh, 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 repair of uh, items that uh, are damaged. But uh, yeah, maybe important to mention this uh, uh, last uh, maintenance we have done that was a full replacement of the hoses. Mm -hmm. All, uh, so this, is a, this was a huge work and uh, needed for safety reason due to the uh, time it, it is in operation. So that uh, means uh, a, a stop, a complete stop for one month, approximately. So yeah, Mark was participating to this uh, and uh, it was quite challenging first time for our team.
to do that uh, and uh, in the middle of the desert so sometimes a uh, uh, few things uh, uh, became a, a complication I don't know screws or something like that uh, at a certain time uh, they come into the critical path yeah maybe Mark has some anecdote uh, here with the German and Chilean colleagues yeah, I think I think you, you're right. Absolutely, the um, I think the planning is the main thing with the maintenance. When you have a major maintenance like that, mm -hmm. we spent months in the planning. Um, uh, not not only for the hoses, but uh, we've also replaced the the axles that you saw um, again for a refurbishment. Um, uh, and it, it takes maybe a, a month to do the work, um, and especially you're on site for that time because. Um, you have to be with the, the contractors and to to uh, help out with the maintenance that's going on. Uh, but it's actually the planning and preparation before it that takes a lot of time and a lot of thought because, as Massimiliano said, we're in the desert. Uh, we we can't really just go down to the local store and buy something. It, uh, the nearest stores in Kalama maybe two hours drive away. So it's um, it's a big challenge and. Um, I think the preparation is key for that, for the big maintenance, um, and also the team as well. Um, the the team team that we have at uh, site is great, um, and at, at least uh, they they make things go smoothly uh, and uh, prepare things well. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of uh, the two transporters, I think I've, from the time that I've been working in Alma, I haven't seen them working at the same time. Usually you have one and then they alternate, no? So this is just for precaution. You can't touch the stars. Sorry, we had a video in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it was, uh, uh, sorry, uh, can you can you repeat the last part, uh, Thais? I, I, I was I didn't asking get... if you use the two transporters at the same time. The, the question really to relocate the antenna so are you alternate just in case if any of them have mechanic issues or yeah the, the standard is uh, uh, to use one at a time uh, one is uh, usually at the high side at 5000 meter where uh, most of the activities take place and the other one is uh, let's say resting uh, in standby uh, at 3000 meter uh, but uh, uh, during some uh, demanding uh, period, we have used both, so create uh, two teams uh, and work in parallel. Okay, that's uh, uh, to to speed up uh, the process. But indeed, uh, uh, we try to alternate them and also to make the same uh, usage, so they uh, don't exceed uh, or exploiting one more than the other. Okay, um, so that's uh, that's the way uh, we use. Perfect. So I think that Nico has a, um, a video that we're going to show to answer more of these questions that people had of the viewers. Um, we will be showing this video, I think it's now. We yeah. can't touch the stars fly through distant galaxies, or even land on planets outside our solar system. So the only way we can really study most of the universe and everything in it is through light, the light we can see and the light we can't. That's why telescopes are so important for astronomers. They are machines for collecting light, all kinds of it. They're just like very powerful artificial eyes to look at the sky. The bigger the telescope, the better it can see. Why? Because bigger eyes, like owl's eyes, have a bigger surface, so more light reaches them, allowing the distinction of fainter differences in color and a sharper vision. Smaller eyes, like spider eyes, have less chance of capturing light, so they have more problems in seeing details, and everything is a little blurry. With telescopes, it's exactly the same. If light was rain, and telescopes buckets to collect it, it's easy to think that the bigger the bucket, the more rain it would be able to gather. Building very big telescopes, though, is not only expensive, but also difficult, and sometimes even impossible. So what if, instead of trying to build a gigantic bucket, you joined a lot of smaller ones together? Well, great idea. That way you'll be collecting the same amount of rain, getting the same information, 
but in a much easier way. Even better, what if instead of trying to collect all the rain, you just collected some of it, with buckets spread in key places so that you have enough to guess the characteristics of the rain falling? Well, that would be much faster and cheaper. That was precisely what astronomers thought years ago. By using several different small telescopes as one, they could see extremely fine details of the universe, just like if they were using a single telescope several kilometers across. They called this technique interferometry. ALMA works exactly this way. It can make 66 antennas work together as one very, very big telescope, making it one of the sharpest eyes to ever scan the sky. With the sharpest eyes of all, ALMA can study very faint light in the universe and capture images astronomers can't even begin to imagine. So yeah, there we see that the reason why the antennas move in different positions throughout the year. Um, we have, I think, another video of the transporters. Ah, we have one question here, yeah. Which are the critical components in case of fail uh, of the transporter machine? Do you have a spare parts? Yeah, we... we uh we maintain a, a critical uh, list of spares uh, that uh, the, those uh, spares that prevent uh, the machine to work in case we don't have uh, and then start a standard uh, maintenance so uh, yeah one of, one of them are uh, these uh, pumps that uh, mark was explaining other one are, for example, the axis. So we have spare axis, and in particular, we have increased this number in the recent uh, years uh, to be able to replace more. Uh, we were uh, with a very limited uh, number due to uh, money, of course, so the, the the quantity of investment we had to do. Uh, and uh, one uh, important is also the hoses that uh, we explained before. So yeah, our our warehouse is full of spares. <laughs> Can you imagine? There's so another question uh, that would be with the altitude. Does this machine uh, resent or have any issues with the high altitude? Like as humans or the car sometimes, they are built to just support that lack of oxygen and everything. Yeah, I understand that. Um, well, the, the engines obviously uh, de derate, or they they have less power um, at the five thousand meters plateau because there's less relative oxygen there. Let's say. Um, mm -hmm. I understand from the start uh, they when when they commissioned the machines, they kind of optimized them for a, a mid level uh, around four thousand meters, uh, maybe Massimiliano. Um, yeah. Yeah, correct. So there were uh, many commissioning at the beginning, at the beginning, because the uh, the, the motors, the engines were uh, uh, installed in, uh, in in Germany, basically sea level almost. Uh, so, but but then it was uh, uh, envisaged to get uh, the the testing at three thousand meter first, and then five thousand meter. So uh, now we we have not never faced. Uh, uh, Troubles with the, with the, this uh, thing. Uh, maybe the the critical parts uh, that uh, we we saw, and and that's why we have these uh, maintenance plans, are the um, UV um, um, protection. Mm -hmm. Let's say the the effect of UV rays. Um, on the hoses in special, uh, in the rubber parts. So we have seen some uh, uh, deterioration and that's uh, the reason of the overhaul we have done recently. So that's, I would say, the main dust is also uh, an enemy. Uh, so uh, we, we have to be careful with that. We had a few of trouble, a few troubles with the uh, sliding um, parts due to uh, uh, dust and uh, some contamination. Mm -hmm. So that has been also uh, critical. Mm -hmm. Is there any other details of uh, 
technicalities of the um, transporters that you want to share with the public that maybe we haven't touched yet? Yeah, maybe uh, maybe the frequency of the relocation. I, I suppose yeah. people are oh, interested yeah. in this. Uh, so we relocate in a normal year this year and the last year were uh, special, of course, due to the pandemic. But usually we relocate every uh, 15 or 20 days. So that's usually uh, the separation between different uh, uh, array configurations. Okay. And the, the number of moves uh, range between uh, 6 uh, or uh, 15. It depends if we are enlarging. When we are reaching the maximum extension, uh, the moves are more. So they can be uh, up to 15. Um, and then it's uh, uh, usually a couple of weeks of a relocation campaign. So every day, uh, you will see the transporter moving around uh, and uh, and uh, and moving antennas. Perfect. And as for your day while you're working on shift, if you can talk us through um, how how does it begin? What are your duties during the shift, so people can relate more of your daily work. If you can start, Mark, please, and then Maximilian. Uh, yeah, it really depends, Thais, uh, because, um, you know, the daily duties can, can vary depending on if we have um, some some kind of issue that, that comes up. Uh, maybe we need to, uh, a typical day could be you have to go to the technical building, report, uh, and then immediately go to the high site, which means being checked with the polyclinic to make sure that you're uh, fit to go to the high site first, uh, then registering with the safety team at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to do an inspection um, on maybe an antenna where you've had a, an issue overnight. Um, so that could be one typical day um, or another typical day could be preparing, like you said, the overhauls uh, of the transporters. Um, so you may be down at the technical building in the hangar preparing the, the equipment um, or working with the contractor. Or, or another day could be in the office. It's just so it's so varied, um, and you know that's one particular reason why I, I love the work. It's so it's so varied. You're working with different machines, different equipment. Uh, I, I can't say any day is the same, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I can say the uh, the tasks are, uh, as Mark said, uh, quite uh, a lot. Um, usually, the uh, the maintenance group has uh, many tasks at uh, the 5,000 meters. So we have uh, uh, people that uh, are uh, regularly checked for the high altitude and uh, not only for the standard medical exam that is uh, yearly in, in ALMA, but also um, uh, daily with the, this medical check. You see now, for example, mm -hmm. in the video, uh, people are checked uh, in the field, okay? And uh, yeah, our experience is that uh, uh, even with the oxygen, sometimes uh, you can feel tired and maybe uh, a bit uh, underperformant uh, when you are at 5,000 meters. Um, people get used, of course, uh, with the with the time. But uh, yeah, it is important to follow procedures. Uh, uh, there are a lot of medical studies about uh, uh, staying intermittently uh, at the high side. Um, yeah, in, in in summary, a uh, lot of work in the array maintenance group is at AOS. So we prepare a lot uh, to to be. As, as effective as possible. So we don't want to exceed the normal quantity of hours, which are few uh, during the day. Uh, nobody is uh, uh, staying overnight, uh, for example. And uh, um, the, uh, the activities in the uh, 3000 meter with laboratories uh, and uh, workshop are also uh, quite demanding. Sometimes we have to rush 
to to prepare the next fix for the next day for example and after the pandemic and the shutdown how is the state of the transporters and the antennas now are they working well are you operational if you could tell us a little bit more about the situation now today in winter time that i know is difficult too no because of the snow yeah yeah it has has been uh, uh complicated this winter we have uh, get uh, uh quite a tough winter so but the uh, antenna are all operational uh we are happy about this after one year uh the observatory uh, has been able to serve the community as before um and transporter to um the the status is as good i would say really? mark maybe maybe yeah you know. I, 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 Actually, during, uh, I think it was January, February, March um, this year, we did, uh, as I mentioned, we exchanged uh, 14 axles on one of the transporters. Uh, so we did the major maintenance and um, now both both transporters are, are working fully um, operating. Um, obviously, as Massimiliano said, one tends to operate, or as you mentioned, Thais as well, you mm -hmm. tend to have one at uh, the high side. Um, in case obviously the road gets blocked and, and also we tend to alternate as well um, but um, as far as i'm aware both both are operational now and back online um, it was actually a challenge to get them back online we had to do a lot of checks initially um, from the team um, they, they put them back in service after a year it was we didn't really know um, how that was going to go uh, but it seems to have gone really well actually uh, and i think the planning was good so such would it uh, continues in that way. <laughs> yeah, that's great news. Yeah. That's very good. And you have a um, specific date now to um, start relocations? Uh, actually, we're, maybe Massimiliano can update, but we're, we're already doing You're already? Ah, sorry. Yes. That. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Uh, the, um, as I said uh, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, the relocation usually uh, reach the maximum extension um, uh, every second year yeah. and uh, the, the year of the maximum extension that is uh, uh, approximately 16 kilometers in diameter uh, was 2020 so in July 2020 we should have reached uh, uh, this uh, uh, big extension with uh, uh, many relocations and clearly the observatory has been affected uh, and, and was in shutdown. So we have uh, repeated the exercise this year, but then also the winter uh, has put uh, uh, some challenging. So we uh, are at the moment in uh, the configuration is called eight. The maximum is 10. Uh, so we are aimed to reach 10 by the end of uh, August. So antenna will be uh, at the, their maximum extension and the maximum resolution, uh, as it was explained by the the video before. Great. So, yeah, yeah, that's great but, news. So, well, I want to thank you both, really, for your time and joining us today. We'll be closing now the tour. Um, Nicolás, that is working with us now he's not on the video but he's helping us he said that we have some questions that will be answered by a video that is going to be shown now so uh, we will make our goodbyes now okay so thank you very much mark and massimiliano for answering all the questions and letting us know more about these impressive machines that are the transporters and yeah we want to thank you so have a good descanso in quarantine. I know that you're doing some of it, Mark. So yeah. <laughs> I hope to see you soon, guys. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much to all. Really appreciate. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. So now we're gonna see. We're gonna watch this video that answers more about the questions that 
you were sending through Facebook and YouTube and Twitter? What if you could only see one color? Not that everything in the world would be the same color, but you could only see things that were, for example, green, and everything else would be invisible. Not such a pleasant reality, is it? Well, it turns out that in a way, it's true. When you look around you, your eyes see what scientists call visible light. And that light, the one we're used to thinking about, is just a very, very small portion of all the different kinds of light that exist in the universe. And most of them are invisible to our eyes. But there are animals that are not blind to those kinds of light. That's why snakes can see even during moonless nights, and bees can see the flowers with the biggest amounts of pollen. They can see lights that we, humans, can't. Snakes can see infrared light, the same kind that allows you to see if you put night vision goggles on. And bees can see ultraviolet, the light that gets your skin burnt unless you protect yourself with sunscreen. All these lights are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, where there are also radio waves, microwaves, X-rays, and gamma rays, all the other lights that we can't see but are essential to our daily life. Microwaves are used to heat up your food, and X-rays that can go through skin are used by doctors to see your bones. The thing is, the story of the universe, of galaxies, stars, and planets, is told through all of these different kinds of light. And because our eyes are no good to see beyond the visible light, astronomers created new eyes that allow them to see far more, telescopes that can see the invisible light. ALMA is one of those telescopes. It can see radio waves. Some places in the universe look dark to our eyes, but shine bright in radio waves. The places where stars are born, for example, are full of dust which blocks visible light, and therefore they are very dark. But radio telescopes like ALMA can see straight through that dust. They can see stars being born. They allow the study of things impossible to study otherwise, like galaxies that are very, very far away, or even the birth of other star systems like our own. So with this, we're closing the um, virtual tour that we did today about the transporters. I hope that everyone enjoyed it. I want to thank everyone for watching us. And stay tuned because next month we're doing another one about the control room. This will be September 23rd. So um, please join us in that one too. Okay. Have a good evening and bye-bye.